and obviously mentally ill people on the subway. And it will be natural for the child to ask, why does this happen? Some adults might even ask this question. It is a natural response to human beings, children especially, like that, to recognize that other human beings, for whatever reason, are not able to fully express their humanity. But most who live in the city long enough will find stories and justifications, explanations for why those people exist in our, in our society, until eventually those people become really invisible or exist on the periphery of our perception and of our, and of our consciousness. Most parents That render white supremacy, white supremacy invisible, tolerable, not as deeply painful as it should be. Is it possible for people, white individuals in particular, to uncover and change those stories as more people are attempting to do now? Or are we all beholden to our rather cruel past? I'm currently researching and writing about what happens when people of different racial backgrounds take on work of anti racism and interpersonal. Can they learn to really see each other? A few, a few years ago, as I mentioned, I stumbled on a curious history in the United States that touches on any of these questions. It is this history that I would like to explore with you tonight. Uh, first, to give background. In the United States in the 1950s and 60s, Black Americans as you all know, began to agitate and organize against Jim Crow rule. The government sanctioned system that relegated black Americans to a second class, less than human human status. A system that had been in place more or less since white southerners were forced to stop enslaving black people. The civil rights movement shocked white people in their southern states, in the southern states, who had hypnotized themselves with the fiction that not only were black Americans of a lower biological and psychological but they were happy to be so. That is, that their condition was one that, on a daily basis, made them smile. This myth that the so-called happy Negroes passed on like mother's milk to some children and believed wholeheartedly. <clears throat> Only through the power of mass protests were white Americans mm -hmm. forced to face themselves. The movement eventually prevailed in uprooting this happy Negro idea in the public consciousness through various legal, political, and moral victories. Even still, in the late 1960s, there remained people who had taken to calling holdouts, white Southern Americans who used their wealth to insulate themselves from the rapid, change, rapid changes happening in society, in society. To hold on to the old myths and to hold on to the institutions they used to pass on these myths to their children. Many of these institutions were privately run residential schools or boarding schools where parents could quite literally send their children away to the pristine countryside to learn and be grown implicitly, but also explicitly, to inherit their whiteness. In 1967, 13 years after the United States Supreme Court ruled it illegal to segregate children by race in public schools, most of these private boarding schools remained all white. Holdouts. It was these keepers of the myth of white supremacy, that is, the white students enrolled at these schools, whose minds a small group of progressives in the South wanted to change. This woman is Anne Ken Forsyth II, pictured, pictured here with her husband. Forsyth was a wealthy philanthropist from North Carolina who inherited her wealth from industrialists on her mother's and her father's sides. 
most notably from her grandmother, from her grandfather, R.J. Reynolds, the tobacco industrialist. Mrs. Forsyth gave money to progressive causes and through various life experiences came to believe in the idea that if you put young people of different backgrounds together in close quarters, they could get to truly know each other, they could have profound conversion experiences and learn to see the world differently and grow and change. She thought that she could change the holdouts in these schools. The schools educated the leadership class and her sight thought that by helping future leaders to become less racist, she might improve all of society. Her plan for doing this was to provide scholarships for black boys and girls to racially integrate these boarding schools. There, black students and white students would study, play, sleep, and eat in the same, place, in the same space. White students, for sight hope, would discover the inherent capacity of their black schoolmates, the inherent humanity, and uproot those old nets in the power of the encounter. I should say that the black children who received scholarships and their families were not empty ciphers. They brought their own beliefs into this as it relates to this experiment and this integration program was an experiment, black Americans brought an almost religious belief in the power of education. Their second class status, which was invisible to white Americans in the South, was of course quite real to black Americans. And for them, one solution to this accidental history was to teach themselves to learn to go to school, to set loose the mind that had been throttled by their state. For many, this belief in the power of education, by, by black parents especially, outweighed even the very justifiable fear that white people would respond to black children's presence in school with senseless violence. So the foundation came offering what was considered a top notch education, many black families agreed. Forsyth started and financed her program called the Stoker Foundation with some of her friends and the group's job was to find just the right black students to make it work. Chief among Forsyth's friends were John E., a novelist of local renown, and his wife, a British stage actress, Rosemary Harris. With a few others, they searched the South for the most talented black students, testing them, interviewing them, meeting their families. Many of those interviews with students were tape recorded more than 50 years ago. Takes that are now in university archives. I want to share some of the audio, audio with you now to help you bring all of this to life. Um, and this is where we've had some difficulty before, but I think it's going to work. Uh, so hopefully this sound will play. Um, and the first interview, interview we'll hear, um, we'll hear a 14 year old boy. That's the. Uh, a uh, French teacher. He's a good teacher, but he just can't keep a quiet class. My special class is quiet until I get in French. <laughs> they don't like French. Well, his classes are kind of boring. I do. Do you like French? Yes. How many years do you like French? Uh, I think this will be my six. You're do you French. Can you speak any Uh. Joe Paolo, Fosse, and Tupa Tupa. Very good. Good action. Well pronounced. Better than my name. So that was a 14 year old kid named Doug talking with Rosemary Harris. Um, next we'll hear John Healy, the novelist, uh, who helped this program. Uh, he's also husband to Rosemary. You're interviewing a student the foundation recruited. Uh, the student uh, told John his, his hobbies were chemistry and eating. <laughs> I love to eat. What do you like to eat most? Oh, I like to eat pizza. What is pizza? French fries, cheese, and milkshakes. Uh, another John, another student told John he was worried about the effects of studying too hard. Whatever you guys should study, study hard. Yeah. We don't push us into exhaustion. Mm -hmm. You know, tagging girls right there. You know, that's not going to Uh, 
Um, I cut these recordings from a co- from a podcast I did for this American Life. Um, that's why some of you hear a little bit of music. Um, I want to play just a couple of more for them because I really love that all these years later, the early scenes from this effort still exist. All of these kids were chosen for the integration program. They went on to white boarding schools. What you can hear most of all is that they were children, uh, very young. John and Rosemary don't tell the kids that the program was hoping to change the minds of white students. They wouldn't tell the white students either. The encounters they hoped to foster would be, in a way, accidental. The the byproduct of normal interaction in school. In these next interviews, they wait until the very end to bring up the fact that the students will be integrating by the schools. They mention race, but in an offhand way. You want to go away to school? Oh, uh, mm-hmm. yes. What do you mean when they want to say they want to go to school? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think so. Are you worried at all about going to the cathedral, you know, these prep schools in the south? Um, in case it isn't clear, when Rosemary asks whether Doug's school is very integrated, she's referring to Doug's public school, uh, where, they, where they are conducting the interview. So I'll just continue. No. Uh, in the sixth grade, I had a friend named Frida. And he asked if I was going to his album sometime. Was he white? Yes. What was his name? Frida. So you really don't find any difference between a white boy and a black boy? No. He's got black qualities. The first Dover scholarship recipients entered schools in the fall of 1967, 13 years after the U.S. Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Education decision. There were 20 black teenagers placed in seven private in seven private prep schools that year in small town Virginia, in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina, on the affluent side of Atlanta, all schools that, that have historically only accepted white children. Over the next 10 years, 140 students will participate. Does it bother you the thought of going to the first predominantly white boarding school? No, I find it. If you have a good sense of humor, you can be allowed people where it doesn't make any difference what race it is. If you can be allowed people, you can be allowed any type of people. Sure. Do you feel that if anybody is kind of a you feel it could rise above it? Yes. Good. Not that you're going to have any, any difficulty, but. Not that you're going to have any difficulty, she says. So, can this program help high school age students form new friendships across racial lines and turn against their up their up, their upbringing and the reality they know? And must black people always take on the burden of re-educating them? Uh, before we take a closer look, maybe we can get a better sense of what our holdouts were holding on to. I want to return to some of the ideas. Historians of white Southerners in the age of the civil rights tell us about how the direct action of the civil rights movement called into question white Southerners' very reality, which, as it turned out, was a false reality. It is not the interracial confrontations, important and tragic as they were, that are of prime significance, wrote the historian John Paul Franklin. It is the South's confrontation with change, its response in defending what it regarded as a perfect society. That is a struggle. And Franklin wrote that the white South's obsession was to maintain a government, an economy, an, an arrangement of the sexes, a relationship of the races, and a social system that has never existed, except in the fertile imagination of those who would not confront either the reality that existed or the change that would bring them closer to reality. As we've seen, at the heart of their imagined reality was a belief in the inferior but happy Negro. In an interview with historian Jason Sokol, one white former told of how, before the movement, white people felt, quote, undisturbed by the Negro race. The farmer said, you had the black fellow as a happy fellow, 
He sings all day. And he don't worry about where his food is coming from tomorrow. Sokol writes that these white assertions of black happiness stem from white's psychological needs to believe in social harmony. Let me start with earlier. Sokol writes that these white assertions of black happiness stem more from white's psychological needs to believe in social harmony than from any evidence that such harmony actually existed. For white people to admit that black people who worked so close to them in the fields and in their stores were in fact simmering with rage, a perhaps murderous rage that was kept in check only by unspeakable white violence was for those white people in the Jim Crow South to face their own inhumanity. Black people were not happy, fulfilled, satisfied, or content for Jim Crow. Many white people claimed affection for blacks, but they did not know the real desires and fears of black people. Or as one journalist of the era wrote, the heart of the problem is not that the white man refuses to sit down at the table but rather than when he does, he refuses to see the real face of the man he's sitting across from. The Stouffer Foundation wanted to help them see. Forsyth and Ely began, imagine, and Ely began imagining their program around the time of the historic march in Washington in 1963. Which we most remember for the, doc, for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's for the Reverend Dr. Moore, who became Jr.'s iconic I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King distilled an idea that had propelled the civil rights movement to its crescendo that day, an idea that drives the most famous line from the speech. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, King said to much applause. He dreamed that one day down in Alabama, with its, with its vicious racists, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters, as sisters in the Not by the color of their skin, but by the continent of character. The idea of colorblindness, an almost common sense notion to us today, at that time had a radical edge because it totally undermined Jim Crow rule in the South. Knowingly or unknowingly, the Stoker Foundation attempted to use this notion of colored blindness to pry loose the old myths that had sustained white suffrage. As carriers of this idea, the black students were under an incredible amount of pressure. Even at their young ages, it was not lost on them that they had to shine in those schools because they were the face of all black people. It is something of a paradox that these emissaries of colored blindness could never be the average of regular black people. They had to be amazing. Still, most of the students responded to the call. In my earlier journalistic exploration of this history of the New York Times Magazine for This American Life, I told the stories of Bill, Ale Bill Alexander and Marlene Bernard, who in 1967 became the very first black student at a boarding school in Lynchburg, Virginia, called Virginia Episcopal School. Bill was from a middle class family, a summer preacher from Nashville, Tennessee. Marvin was from a poor family in Richmond, Virginia. You can get to know more of them if you read or listen to my earlier features. But for now, the key thing to know is that Bill and Marvin were exceptional beyond measure. When they started at Virginia Episcopal School, the school still had the practice of publicly posting student rankings based on the students' grade point averages at the end of each semester. Bill and Marvin's very first semester of the school, they topped all of their white classmates, finishing first and second in their class. And they repeated the feat every semester for the next four years. As Marvin told me a couple of years ago, those white boys knew. Bill and Marvin believed that because they shone like stars, their white classmates had truly seen them. But they would find out later that they were mistaken. Martin Luther King was assassinated during the spring of their first year school. Bill and Marvin, who were roommates, were in the dormitory bedroom when news came over the radio that King had been gunned down. Their moment of deep sadness was cut short by a swell of laughter coming from their white classmates who were celebrating the news in the halls. We had made some miscalculations about how people felt in their hearts, Marvin told me. Let's move on.
Bill and Margaret hardly knew what they were up against. When the school decided to open its doors to them, most parents revolted. Why, why, why have you done this cruel thing to our beloved school? One parent wrote to the board of trustees. A private boarding school like UBS is, is an extension, a part of the family, another wrote. We have no intention whatsoever of integrating those in other ways into our family. And today, though the school will forever commemorate their superstar black alums, when I asked their white classmates, white men in their 60s now, about whether they were changed by their encounters with Bill and Margaret, I hear a common refrain. I don't see color. I don't see color. The American sociologists Michael Omi and Howard Wynant, in their classic book, Racial Formation in the United States, point to Martin Luther King's assassination and the uprisings and fires in 1967 and 1968. As a pivotal moment in history when the notion of color, as a pivotal moment in history when the notion of colorblindness began to be twisted. The black led movement had been successful by drawing on fundamental American ideals and church beliefs and open up, opening up the opportunity for a radical democratic, democratic transformation, the sociologists argued. The governing racial regime was seriously challenged, and the powerful reacted by working to demobilize the black movement and other anti-racist movements it spawned. Rearticulating the idea of colorblindness was a part of that. Colorblindness is a highly contradictory phenomenon, only in the moment way. In the past, it was a call for racial equality and inclusion. Today, it is largely an ideological framework for the effacement of race consciousness. They add, race thinking, it is argued, no longer significantly informs our perceptions, shapes our attitudes, and influences our individual, collective, and institutional practices. Indeed, it is said that the most effective anti-racist consciousness, policy, and practice is to simply ignore race. We are urged to see people as individuals only. If we return to the question of myths that obscure our reality, is colorblindness the myth that blinds us to the racism before our very eyes? An even more troubling question posed by Michelle Alexander, by Michelle Alexander in her classic book, The Jim Crow, Mass incarceration, mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness, is whether affirmative action, by which I mean opportunity programs targeting black people and other people of color, offer, quote, relatively meager material advantages or significant psychological benefits to people of color in exchange for the abandonment of a more radical movement that promised to alter the nation's economic and social structure. She says that seeing black people like Bill and Marvin and the other graduates of the Stoker program graduate from Harvard and Yale and become doctors or corporate lawyers, not to mention the first black president of the United States, leads to exaggerated claims of racial progress and overly optimistic, overly optimistic assessments of the future for African Americans, rendering a vast black underclass invisible. Again, I find this troubling. When I was a teenager, I went to a mostly white private school in Atlanta, Georgia, as a scholarship student. When I met the graduates of the Stouffer Foundation during my research and reporting, I felt like they were my forebears, the ones who opened the door to me. I have built a life around notions of colorblindness. I've been intentional, intentional about making and caring for friends from various racial backgrounds. My wife, here with us tonight, is a white woman from Denmark. I can remember when I was younger, having a guarded feeling around my white people, a sense that I was blocking something, blocking myself. I did not want to feel that. I'd seen the anger from black people in my parents' generation, justifiable anger, but I did not want that. I learned about how race is a constructed idea. So I started the work of deconstructing race in my life. I want to believe in the open encounter especially as a storyteller, to believe that we can truly see each other. 
Yet my research on this project brought me to something of a head spinning crisis point. The sociologists only in Wyoming describe it perfectly. We have not yet emerged from this ongoing pattern of racial contradiction, the chronic racial dilemma we are still in. It is quite mind boggling when looked at as a whole. On the one hand, the old verities of established racism and white supremacy have been officially discredited, not only in the United States, but fairly comprehensively around the world. On the other hand, racially informed action and social organization, racial identity and race consciousness continue unchecked in nearly every aspect of social life. On the one hand, the state, many states around the world, now claims to be colorblind, non-racialist, racially democratic, while on the other hand, in almost every case, those same states need race to rule. Consider it in the United States alone, race and electoral politics, race and social control, race and legal work. Why don't our heads explode under the pressures of such, of such cognitive dissonance? Yes, that is how it feels. Is there no real percent potential for an interpersonal kind of exchange, for opportunities to really see each other? and to unveil white supremacy? Or will such progress continue to take mass black death in the wake of a pandemic, or horrific videos of black people being murdered by police flying around the internet? The Black Lives Matter movement, which, man which managed to pull white people into the anti-racism movement in significant numbers, makes me feel good. But look at the horrors it took. That's depressing. We need more hope than that. How do we socialize our children? The Stoker Foundation was flawed, but I still find some heroism in the attempt to root out racial myths among white people. What to do? I'll wrap up with an idea from the sociologist Omi and Wayne, who had the good work to finish her study of race and racism on Hope and Love. They write No one, no matter what their racial identity is, can be free of racism in their heads or hearts. It is too deeply ingrained in the U.S. social structure. Structural racism determines that a comprehensive system of advantages and disadvantages, economic, political, cultural, and psychological, suffuses U.S. society. Yet a great deal of thought and action has been devoted to the problem of fostering anti-racist practice at the individual and ex experiential level. Developing these skills fostering the interruption and interrogation of racism, and extending the reach of anti-racism in workplace, politics, family, school, cultural life, and indeed every interaction is an important dimension of the practice we have to Thank you. And that wraps it. Now we can have a conversation. Lovely. Uh, I love the. Uh, um, what's it here? Is that okay? Um, I, in the New York Times article, you can see the imagery of all the young boys with their 60s hairstyles and the glasses, and they're using this kind of thing to be dapper. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then you see the older guys in their 60s. Uh, settled um, middle aged men, yeah. what we now say, and I always think it exhibits, and I thought we'd love to have that exhibit on our walls uh, with the stories behind what they have to tell and, uh, and the quotes of, of the young men um, exposed like, on, on the walls. It's, uh, um, it's very beautiful to see. I'm, I'm, I, I'd like to know a little bit. More about the way you researched or study before we um, start talking about all these concepts of mm -hmm. race and, and racism and how like I, how you how you evaluate the, the whole thing. Of course, it, it's intricate and there are many aspects to it, but I would probably think that. In the, in the long run, you would say that these young men uh, profited from the situation, 
but that some may be not not naked, or, or did some racial conflicts make the um, experience impossible? Um, I'll respond to the first part of the question first, um, which is how did I first approach it? And um, I first approach it very much from a story perspective, and by that I mean kind of um, narratively looking for characters with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, so we started with about 140 people who I had uh, contact information for. And um, I met with a lot of them in a room that they were having, and I talked to them on the phone. And at that point, you're just having conversations, listening for what is most interesting, which, I mean, it sounds class, but also not much um, in terms of building the story. Um, and, you know, like a lot of people had what would be very mundane experiences and didn't have very strong memories of what happened. But every once in a while, we'd have a conversation with someone, um, and your jaw would just drop. I remember the first conversation I had with Marvin. We talked for like two and a half to three hours um, because he had all these stories. He had all these stories. And so, you know, like I'm getting into all these ideas now, but primarily or originally, I was a journalist, you know. Um, and so I was hearing these things, and I'm like, okay, so that's the story that I, that I want to tell. And then I started talking to other people who were around him, and the story just kind of um, expanded in layers that had so much kind of natural symbolism um, that I could work with. So Bill and Marvin were um, the top two students in their class um, that first year. Um, they were competing with each other, and there was this kind of race they had that was very dramatic. Um, um, and within the next year after them, things changed. And there was a very neat way, narratively, there were characters who showed the other side of the story, who showed the darker side of the story, and these people suffered in a way that were And so um, I had in, in their kind of story a nice microcosm of what I wanted to do um, more broadly. Um, only more recently have I kind of gotten into. Um, um, what I would consider, you know, a lot more theoretical reading, um, and that is partly because of the pandemic. Um, I was not able to visit people, um, and I had to kind of cut short my search for characters. So, and moving from the stories that we read to the book, I was looking for more people, more stories to tell, and more drama to build the story on, and. Um, I was in a stage of my reporting where I already talked to people who were eager to talk, and I was trying to find people who were, you know, more reticent or harder to find or you know, that kind of thing. Those types of types of conversations go much better in person. Um, so I was ready to start traveling, but that was that happened right as things kind of shut down. So I had to figure out, like, well, how do I approach this? And um, and you know, part of being at the American Academy of Berlin is being surrounded by these academics who are, you know, like deep in this academic research, and I kind of like, well, okay, well, I guess I'll start doing that stuff too, and um, and I and I kind of got this um, got much more steeped in the ideas of of, of of this history than I was in a way that um, was very helpful um, to in framing in framing the kind of very material that I had. Um, and so now I can I can look at those um, people who did very well, and I can say that um, there are many who, uh, like Bill and Martin, were not only exceptional, exceptional in high school, but had opportunities um, in college, um, and then professionally they continue to do um, exceptionally well. Um, and there's research that bears out that um, that. Um, Scholarship or affirmative action programs in the late 60s and early 70s were pretty successful um, in providing opportunity for black students. Um, but it's also the case that the incredible pressure and also the racial hostility, hostility that was taking place caused many people to just break uh, uh, the magazine pieces and the piece and the podcast really uh, centered around the story of this guy named John Holloway, who um, Essentially, was traumatized by this experience, and only now, 
then two years ago, uh, was able to uh, really uh, make peace about make peace with with what went through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you were out expanding in Missouri. Mm -hmm. You're a couple of years. Um, As a fellow. Another African business college. Oh. Uh, and, uh, and I think he says something like, "You don't have to be a race, and you don't necessarily." Are the status of racist, but there are racist actions, and I think I'm kind of um, Yeah, the good news is that racist and anti racist are not based identity. You can be racist one minute and then anti racist the next. And I think, I mean, I think that's a great concept, but if I look at this story and how some of the southern families are, um, are knit. I feel like the racism is part of the identity. It's not even about the actions. They might even be in action, anti-racist, but the identity is kind of programmed as racist. I, I, that's just a feeling I had when I thought about Kendi and, and your, your story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it's, it's, it's I mean, one of the, the ideas that Ed Forsyth and Johnny Amy had was that Friendship and closeness and, you know, like uh, honest mutual exchange, you'd be able to, to overcome that. Um, but, and, 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 and that kind of natural encounter would be able to overcome that. But to any, any encounter we bring, history, we bring family, um, all of those experiences that we've had. Um, and so how are those encounters can we have casual encounters and expect those encounters to overcome those things that the guys just have to be more intentional and we have to be kind of more active in those areas in those encounters? And I think that the answer is, is probably yes because we're so steeped in um, and, and kind of white supremacy. I mean, so much so that even people who are black have these ideas. That, that are a part of us, and and so it's it's like we're living and breathing these images uh, and stories um, um, about whatever black criminals, black whatever, and we we soak them up, and so the movement turning away from that, I think, has to be an intentional turning away towards. It can't. I think it has to be. It has to be about that. I think, I mean, giving us great opportunity to talk about the Kennedy ideas to have an open conversation and saying, like, I'm not saying that you are a racist, but I think this was just a, this was a racist action, and I can point that out because I've condemned you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I think that's uh, probably a way. Yeah, I, know, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that it's, I, I mean, nobody is something. Nobody is defined as something that is unchanging. We are all... Uh, in the process of uh, becoming um, and learning, and those interactions are not reflective of um, um, like an unchanging nature. So in those encounters, you know, it's, it is important to say, um, I, I, I find some problems with that thing that you do that you said, but um, I'm not, I'm not um, casting you as a evil. You know, you don't have a hard heart. Uh, <laughs> Permanently, um, and, and those situations, those conversations, I think, are difficult because it, on, on the part of the person who has perhaps been or felt wronged, it takes some patience and some, um, you know, kindness and, and forgiveness to to not totally condemn that person. Um, and on the other hand, the other person has to be open to the criticism or to the to what they're hearing. I mean, I think it's 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 difficult. So it does take friendship first. I think it, conversation. Yeah, I think it I think it does require some type of trust. And did you at least always find that um, interracial friendships were formed at these schools that relaxes uh, black boy? Yeah, um, there were there were definitely friendships that lasted to black. Um, I didn't find as many as I expected or hoped to find. Um, and I don't know if that's just because 
you know, like 50 years has passed and people haven't been able to get into their lives. So your family's moved to a different parts of the other country. And, you know, they were in high school at Pink Bay and, and, and we're in high school at the time and people were less connected than we are now. Um, so you kind of moved on. Um, but I, I didn't find a lot of people who were best buds uh, after you guys are always talking in, um, in your writing and in this American Life Story about how, um, how the scholarship kids were aware of how symbolic they were and the pioneer effort that they were in, and, and maybe that can make people feel a little bit hard. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, both parties. It's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly artificial situation that requires, you know, performance um, that. Um, Maybe cricket that's kind of like a natural relaxed um, exchange. And the, the New York Times article is called The Way to Get Is to Get Straight A's. The Way to Survive is to Get A's. I know. I thought about that. I do think that it, I mean, you can think about gender roles as well. That women have to perform at a job and be so much better than the men. And I, I don't know. I'm in my 40s and it just makes me tired and I just want to do. I mean, of course, I want to excel at what I do, but I don't want to have to do like twice as much just because I'm a woman. And I just the whole concept of that. Of course, I know whoever's in the minority situation, that's the rule. You've got to be better. But where, like, when do we get to that? The the average. Is right, right, right. Yeah, that's the thing about this. Like these these students were like exceptional beyond. They were they were like superstars. And this program would not have, maybe it wouldn't have worked if you just sent like regular average performing people and uh, students into these schools because it, it would have been too easy for white students in those schools to kind of dismiss them uh, according to um, surveillance stereotypes. So it's, yeah, it does require like a twice as good performance um, in order to, to be seen. That's not true of being seen. Yeah. I mean, you went to um, to a private school. Did mm -hmm. you feel the pressure to perform? Um, I would say that my experience was um, pretty positive. Um, I went to a fairly progressive um, private school in Atlanta that was uh, founded by uh, hippies in the seventies. It was like you know kids playing hacky sack and walking around barefoot and calling to you by their first names. It's very informal. Um, Atlanta is also uh, a majority black city. Uh, so there, even if there were, even if I was in the minority on campus, I never felt the minority in the, in the city. Um, so I did, I, I felt pretty at ease, pretty at ease there. And I made some relationships, friendships that last till today. And when we go back to the boys in the 60s, um, they were prepped uh, before they went to school on like, okay, how to hold a tennis racket or... I like white manners. Yeah. Right. Um, so how are you handling the topic of class in your book? Um, I don't know if I'm going to handle the topic of class explicitly, though. Well, I should say, there is this aspect of um, of, um, of this program that, so she, the woman who started the program, paid for these students to um, go to these schools, to go to these elite schools, and there's a way that this education, this elite education, had certain type of manners and there's certain that, that people were expected to perform. Um, not only perform, but to adopt. And so the question is like, what does it mean for them to um, adopt those types of manners? Are they, um, um, having to kind of take on a certain way of being in order to fit in, and if, if they were having to do that, is it really doing the work of, of um, educating the white students about, about their values? Mm -hmm. um, so that is a big question. Mm -hmm. When we talked earlier, and I, I, I said, uh, I think class markers were clearer back then, and I think they still exist, but they're Hidden in a sneaky way. Yeah. Uh, everything seems more egalitarian, the way people dress, and many things are more accessible to everyone, but that doesn't mean that uh, people of a certain class recognize each other in a certain way. And uh, 
speaks to Jesus, that speaks to us. All right, I don't want to take up all of the time and open it up to uh, anything you'd like to add or question. No questions so far. Sure, if you want to question. Did the plant for pets experiment succeed? Yeah. Did schools become more integrated? Um, it took a long time. Um, so she, the program was pretty was in effect from 1967 until about 1974. She had a dedicated pot of money, and when that pot of money ran out, uh, the program stopped. Um, at Virginia Episcopal School, a school that I that I researched uh, closest, um, when that pot of money when that money ran out, uh, and she stopped paying for students to go to those schools. There was a long period of time that there were no more black students. Um, 10 or 12 years or something like that, there were no more black students. And diversity started to pick up again when a separate foundation started an effort that was kind of building on um, um, uh, the separate foundation effort. Um, and this second foundation uh, worked to make uh, more institutional changes. Uh, rather than just kind of sending students, they worked more on uh, also getting black teachers into the program, setting up um, inter-school um, associations that were working on diversity issues. And so it became more structural, these changes. And then after that, things started to go in that direction. But it took a long time. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Mm -hmm. Are there any private boarding schools in the US now that you're aware of that are still seemingly totally shut off from racial diversity? Um, they would never say that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that there are some that are that are mostly white, and it, it has to. It, it, I think it's like a political thing. Like they're because they are fairly conservative areas, um, they're less attractive. I think to people of color, and the schools perhaps don't mind them that way. Um, uh, but I think for the most part, it's become. Um, almost a requirement for schools to be able to at least promote diversity, um, even if it's not genuine. Like it's, it's something that they use as a recruiting tool. Um, whether it's um, um, people in the states from various kinds of racial and ethnic backgrounds or people from, from abroad. Um, I think it's now perceived that even for white students, it's an advantage to be in a diverse background because it represents the type of society that they will have to enter when they graduate. The question has already been asked. Oh. Are there any any more like experiments today that are accompanied scientifically? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, and this 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 program attempted a somewhat kind of social scientific um, survey of what happened, but I consider it to be um, somewhat crude. So after they after this program concluded in 74-75, they passed these surveys around to the schools, um, um, asking students about their attitudes uh, around race, um, how they respond to certain situations, um, to see if their behavior had changed. But the problem was it wasn't an exhaustive survey. They kind of handed them out in school to whoever happened to be there that day um, and collected whichever ones they got back. And so there wasn't really a way to kind of tabulate um, um, in any kind of social, in any kind of with any kind of rigor that would that would um, you would require for a social science study. So it's difficult to say how this study even even went. Um, but I'm not aware of any kind of contemporary surveys of, of this nature. Right. Sorry, it's sort of in the same train of thought as these schools you were mentioning were sort of pioneers in trying to desegregate and closing those opportunity and achievement gaps maybe. Um, are you aware of private schools or maybe even charter schools that are still um, trying to overcome the sort of opportunity and achievement gaps still existing today, maybe also in combination with, you know, a focus on proficiency rather than growth um, in education, so that might be using their status uh, outside of the Common Core framework as private or charter schools to 
try and close those gaps? Um, yes. Um, I, I think there are programs that exist that are working on trying to close those gaps, and there are also programs that exist that are trying to, um, I would say, more than close the gaps, educate uh, black students and students of color to get into elite schools. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, um, the program that, that I was a part of in high school, there's a, there's a national program in, in the United States called A Better Chance, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially a scholarship program that uh, places um, uh, students of color into elite schools. Um, and um, test into it, they, there's a certain amount of, um, you know, they're already working with kind of gifted students, but there is some training that happens after to help them get into these schools and then, and then on to elite college and universities. And there are various kinds of programs like this. The A Better Chance program is a program that's national. There's one called Prep for Prep, um, which is based in New York, which works with um, New York students to help place them into elite private schools. Um, there's other ones called Oliver. Um, but there are also programs that are well, like more kind of tutoring and mentoring programs, which are working with students from more disadvantaged backgrounds to help them kind of get to a um, just kind of level playing field with with um, students in, in uh, what you expect from an average student. So those programs also still exist. I mean, I've got to bring it in, but one new thing, if you hear the congregation say, stand back and stand by. I mean, it's very scary. Um, I mean, it just makes me angry, but now that we're having it, it just always, it's like, it always makes me angry, but now that if I'm thinking about it in this context, it's, it's scary, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a... Um, what seems to be happening is that there's, there's always been like an undercurrent of, of racism, white supremacy in the United States. But for a long time, partly because of the things we've been talking about, expectations around colorblindness and the way that you're able to behave in the public, it wasn't something that could be expressed publicly. Um, and so now there's like, because he feels like that's his base and how he can um, remain in power politically, that has that that has been brought into the public in a way um, like it hasn't been for a long time. I mean, it, it's, it's the president, but it's also the way the internet has allowed people to kind of get together and communicate, create these communities. Um, um, but yes, these things are now out in the open. And to me, it feels very dangerous. Um, I don't know if anyone saw, but just a couple of days ago, there was. Um, these white militia guys in Michigan who were arrested for this plan to kidnap the governor of Michigan. Michigan's one of these states where there's been all these revolts about wearing masks. Mm -hmm. um, and the FBI arrested these guys who had a pretty elaborate plan to get to kidnap and maybe kill um, uh, Whitmer, which her last name. Um, the government, and, it's, and, it's, and it seems to me that there's been the president has emboldened pretty crazy um, um, uh, violent, violent extremists. Um, yeah, so it's it's scary to see. I always have to quote that we had a big, big correspondent here from the big. German newspapers who had a White House pass over when he was a correspondent over there. And he'd written three books on the Obama. And when I, it was during the Obama years, and I asked him, So, how about racism in the US? He said, Oh, we can't do that. Um, and I keep, I keep thinking about that. I remember that that was super ridiculous back then, but I'd like to quote it back to his face. Yeah, you know, when I was reading, doing this reading the last couple of months, I, uh, who was it? I mean, I don't think so. um, <laughs> uh, but I came across a quote, a quote just like that from a prominent journalist after Obama who said that we were in a post-racial period. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and there was that sense. I mean, I think that's a lot what some of these thinkers are saying is that the success of a few people 
is something that is, that is blinding us to what is um, so widespread. You can have these exceptional people, and um, but there are so many who are left behind. And one of the things that I really like about Michelle Alexander's work in focus, focusing on um, the criminal justice system and mass incarceration is because she, when we look at statistics about um, how well um, um, black communities are faring, they often don't include people who are in prison and who are in jail. It's like they are aside, um, set aside from society. Um, but when you include them, things look really bad. Um, and so there's a, there's a way in which black people also don't want to include them because there's a way that um, in order for, like there's a, there was a force in the black community toward um, you know, respectability and, and, and being um, twice as good um, um, and, and, and wanted to kind of disassociate from those criminal elements um, because they kind of cast them a, a bad light on the rest of us, but when you kind of can, if you can if you look at the black community as a whole, including them, then we see that things are there's no way to replace racial, yeah. um, even with a black president. Um, so it's it's um, yeah it's, it's almost absurd to even to even make that argument. And of course now we see it um, as these people are coming into uh, coming into view. And they didn't just materialize magically when Trump was elected. They've been there. I mean, I mean, we're of course having uh, conversations about race in our work, in the talks that we hold, and we've done that for a long time. But the death of George Floyd has definitely totally changed the way people are talking to each other. And um, the view we hosted an online panel discussion about the death of George Floyd. And five or six African Americans from a private community that some of them I've known for 10 years and we've had conversations about race, but it, it never talked like that. Mm -hmm. It was very different, it was very open. People talked about their personal bad experiences, um, maybe a more pessimistic outcome that they would otherwise admit that they had. And I feel like, you know what, I'm having a bit of a metaphorical deja vu with these um, Sexy glass spinning walls. When I like think about when I whenever I lived in the US, I thought it was so interesting to see how uh, whites and blacks interacted without <coughs> looking at each other, or like a very safe there was like all these um, learned um, encounters that show people well at a very distance from each other. And people are interacting. But it's as if they're not even looking at each other. Right? I, I can't even say it. It's like a plexiglass wall mm -hmm. that's making sure we are interacting, but we both know. Like there's no spin. Like, you know, yeah. there's like this thing. There's something of ourselves that we're holding back. Yeah. Um, this other part of us, whether anybody, this other kind of cultural part of us that we know that you know, we're not going to express that cultural part of us or our yeah. here. You know, that's that's where we're here. It's it's very much like that. I like it's half. I mean, we feel like it's a more open conversation about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's rough in some parts and, and dangerous, but um, at least we felt like in the conversations with African Americans in our community that the conversation has been more open and honest mm -hmm. with um, the white audience as well. And I think that's like, I'm trying to say something positive. No, I know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I felt very hopeful. I felt. After after George after the protests happened, I was like, this feels like something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like yeah, it, it felt like something. When you looked at the images coming back from the protests in the media and social media, most of the people were white um, who were walking, mm -hmm. and um, most of the people were yeah, most of the people were white. I mean, I, I, and I. In cities all around the country and really all around the world, and it seems like something opened up, um, and and it's difficult to know. Like, I, it feels a little bit like it's already started to to dissipate a little bit, um, but it definitely felt like something mm -hmm. that there were new conversations that were happening. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And it's a weird thing because it wasn't like that was the first COVID video. You know, I think it was, I think it had a lot to do with the pandemic in the United States, um, which played out so disproportionately um, um, in the black community, which targeted the black community in a way that didn't target the white community. So people saw that. People also, everybody was at home looking at videos or whatever. So everyone was stuck watching this thing or stuck on social media seeing a reaction. And um, it just kind of created this moment where people couldn't help but respond. But, I mean, like, as I said, like, the fact that it took that is a little bit depressing, but I guess at least we're now in the, whatever it is that we are in, it seems like maybe we're moving in a good direction. Mm -hmm. we, I, I'd just be wondering, and maybe taking it back to um, you know, desegregating schools as a topic that we started with. I keep wondering, and maybe it's just because uh, I only recently read Colson White and the Nickel Boys, which, and he was here three years ago, just about this time of year. Um, and of course, the premise of that novel is vastly different, but, you know, I keep wondering, even though the narratives that you've shown us and the stories you've shown us um, with, you know, at least Marvin and Bill exceeding, succeeding academically, I keep wondering whether there are stories also of, you know, that social the integration didn't work as well, or there were horror stories as such as, you know, maybe it's just me with that in the back of my head. No, um, there there were definitely horror stories. I mean, um, I don't know if, I'm, if it'll fit into the book, but there was this guy who um, went to a boarding school in Alabama uh, called Indian Spring School, and it was probably the most conservative of all the schools that were in this program. Um, and um, he was from Houston, Texas, and he was best friends with another guy in this program. And they had very parallel lives. Both of their parents were kind of involved in the civil rights movement. They both were kind of um, from an upper middle class black community in Houston. And so to me, they are. Um, almost a, a case study, and, and because they were so similar, where one went right and one went wrong. Um, and this guy who went to this, most, this is more conservative school where he appears to have had a tough time, um, something snapped in him um, that I, I don't quite know, but something went really wrong for him. And um, I learned about him through court documents because um, later he went to university, and then he went to the Army, um, and um, he came back from the Army, he was living in Washington, D.C., and he had this kind of break where he um, killed his girlfriend. And um, he was caught and put on trial, and um, in the testimony, there is discussion of his experience at school as something that kind of made him, that broke him. I don't really know what that was because he won't respond to me, but just that document says to me that something traumatic happened to him there that, that um, caused him to have some type of break. Starting again and continuing into the future. I don't know, I don't know, but that's a little bit of speculation. But also, there are people who, you know, it wasn't always trauma. Sometimes it, it was just, um, you know, like, um, frustration at not being able to express yourself and not being able to express yourself culturally, wear the clothes you want to wear, be who you think that you, who you are, um, having your identity called into question all the time. Like that was a, a pretty common thing. Being, um, um, you know, you see different experiences between the boys and the girls. In the early years of the program, they were only in boys' schools, but they eventually got into girls' schools. Um, and you see a lot of the, the girls didn't really face as much physical uh, aggression, um, but they were, there was like a lot more pressure for them to um, uh, kind of try to dress or, or be, dress or you know, express themselves in ways that they didn't feel like were true to themselves. Um, so there was, there was definitely um, a dark side. And, and even the people who did really well, like I remember talking to this one guy, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something like, um, you know, we did very well, um, 
but there are things that happen that I that I that I don't want to talk about. I mean, things are actually coming back to me now, like people like really mean pranks, like a snake in the bed, or like one guy was there was, there was a rig. It was it was rigged so that when he went into his dorm room, the light fixture would fall on his head. Like there were just like really mean things that would happen to some of these kids. Um, and the story I talk about this guy who was almost killed. Uh, who was um, held outside of the window by his ankles by these, um, by these uh, white kids who were, um, who, were, who were bullying him. Even. And so there were definitely uh, really dark moments for, for many, of these, many of these people. Do you see other tools that you have besides like the protests and the other programs to end bigotry? Like, is there something that you're burning for that you feel like this should be done, or do you need a strategy? Or, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems to me that there, there are kind of two levels that we're operating on. One is kind of the way that we build our personal lives and, and how we interact with each other, and the other is, um, you know, the more institutional kind of brain problems that we're dealing with. Um, you know, I think it's important for, just so that we remain hopeful that we can make a change, that we do and the things that we have control over um, make that effort, um, whether it's kind of having those kinds of conversations, you know, really trying to see people you know, being intentional about uh, being around a lot of people from, from different backgrounds and perspectives. Um, and doing that, you know, really kind of everyday work about uh, dismantling you know, these ideas. But there, is, there are these other levels um, which um, there needs to be work done, and that kind of requires some leadership at, at um, you know, government or, or corporate levels, you know, like they're um, uh, in so many areas, and I'm thinking right now about American society, but in so many areas of American society, leadership in terms of what's, um, uh, you know, what happens with, with students in public schools, um, uh, you know, access to um, healthcare in black communities, um, uh, so, so many, so many things. Um, the the um, access to opportunity in, in neighborhoods where there are not um, you know educational programs and social programs for students who want to um, you know do something uh, with their lives that's, that's that's different than what's around them. Like there's so many ways in which those things um, have happened, and those things require leadership. Um, but you would think that there would be some type of communication or exchange between those two. Um, um, approaches and, and that, you know, if, if we're doing our part in our world, then that, then that will kind of uh, set the stage for these other things that happen there, and they're both happening together. But um, I think it takes both of those things. Mm -hmm. I think something that's possible, and kind of finding uh, your own opportunity to show leadership in a situation like that. Right. Because some people just shy away and feel like, what can I do? But I think um, it's very easy to ignore. Yeah. and do nothing um, because you know you just you can stay in your little bubble and then not really worry about it. But I think it does require um, you know being proactive in a way that's intentional. Um, that requires that takes some work um, and some effort that may not be natural. You know, it's like okay, there's this. I'm going to this thing. I'm having this conversation. How can I? In this moment, advance this issue. I think it takes that level of um, intentionality. I think we'll take that with us. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Uh, I think that's really great and it's been good for all of us. Uh, we are screening a couple of other events. We're doing mm -hmm. Zoom talks. I think second of the election with Sunita Mastanda on the 22nd of October. We're uh, screening, uh, it's not an election night, but a countdown to the election night from the SAM studio. And uh, Phil Gorski, um, a religious, a professor of religious studies from Yale will talk on December 1st about the evangelical right and the current feminist tradition in the church. Mm -hmm.